Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Ryan Berg. I'm the director of the Americas program here at CSIS. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for this wonderful event on political prisoners and the future of Nicaragua. Before we formally begin, let's talk logistics. This event will last approximately 90 minutes. We will have simultaneous interpretation from English to Spanish and Spanish to English available during today's event. Please use the headsets available at your seats to tune in if you wish. Ahora en español. Durante el evento. Now in English. During the event, we will have simultaneous interpretation from English to Spanish and Spanish to English. Please use the headsets that are available in your seats to listen to the conversation in your preferred language. Today, uh, in person, please submit questions by scanning the QR codes, which are on the side of the stage here, and you'll be taken to a screen with your cell phone where you can input your question on a web page. Please note that this live stream discussion will be made available on the event web page following the end of today's event. Again, good afternoon. Today we are witnessing the consolidation of an attempted dynastic dictatorship in Nicaragua. The brutal regime of Daniel Ortega and Rosario Murillo has spearheaded a crackdown on all forms of dissent that has left Nicaraguans behind bars, democracy discarded, and society paralyzed. Just yesterday, the regime shuttered the Red Cross and confiscated its property. Scholars have started to speak of the regime not just in terms of radicalization, but in terms of a Talibanization of its policies. In this context, the, re the recent release of 222 political prisoners formerly held by the regime offers a moment to pause, reflect, and most importantly, to galvanize interest in bringing greater, and we hope more effective, pressure against the Ortega Murillo regime. Most importantly, the United States and its international partners must develop an effective sanctions architecture to cut the regime's sources of financing and demand the release of the remaining political prisoners in the country. These are not easy feats and they will require courage and determination to see through. But fortunately, these are traits that the Nicaraguan people have shown in spades. Today, we are honored to host some of the most prominent voices in the ongoing struggle for democracy in Nicaragua including former political prisoners, a leading voice from the diaspora, and internationally recognized human rights defenders and advocates. To begin our event today, I am pleased to introduce Jared Genser and Juan Felipe Wills. Jared and Juan Felipe will present their recent report, which I have a copy of right here. Uh, unpacking in depth the treatment of political prisoners in Nicaragua and the Ortega Murillo regime's gross violation of human rights. Jared is the Managing Director at Perseus Strategies and the Special Advisor on the Responsibility to Protect at the Organization of American States. A seasoned international human rights lawyer, he has written and spoken at length on defending democracy around the world. And Juan Felipe is the Václav Havel Human Rights Fellow at Perseus Strategies. He holds an LLM from Harvard Law School, and previously worked for three and a half years at the Colombian Defense Ministry, advising on human rights and international humanitarian law, and collaborating closely with the military, police, and international organizations to promote respect for human rights. Jared and Juan, welcome. Thank you for all the work on this excellent and timely report. So uh, thank you uh, so much, Ryan, uh, for the kind introduction, and it's always a pleasure to be here at CSIS. Uh, we are incredibly grateful that you are giving us the opportunity today to present uh, our report. Um, given that the report itself is some 225 pages, we'll be doing the short version uh, of the report itself, and uh, very much look forward to sharing with you uh, some of the key insights that we, we found. Uh, in addition, uh, as I think you're seeing on the screen, there is a uh, PowerPoint slides that we'll be working through as well. You'll see today's discussion is, of course, about summarizing the findings and recommendations from our report. And we're going to provide some background on the report and an overview, talk about the executive summary, highlight some illustrative cases uh, or how we gathered uh, them together, provide further information on perpetrators, Nicaraguan law and international law, talk about the global response of the international community to date, and then summarize our key recommendations. So the report itself is the first comprehensive review of the situation of political prisoners published in, in, uh, in English. 
that was authored by our public interest law firm, uh, Perseus Strategies, in collaboration with international and local NGOs, which need to remain anonymous for security reasons. Uh, as noted, the report is 225 pages long, um, but for those without perhaps the patience to uh, read this in such enormous detail, uh, there's of course a strong executive summary table of contents and set of recommendations. Um, I'm not expecting that you're going to be able to read this very well, um, but this is just more showing you the, um, the four pages of the table of contents, and you can see all the different aspects of what we talk about um, you know, in the report itself, background on political prisoners in Nicaragua, how we identify political prisoners, illustrative cases across categories, perpetrators, um, domestic Nicaraguan law and its constitution and international law. Um, we also have a section on the international response to the imprisonment of Nicaragua's political prisoners. Mm -hmm. And then six specific recommendations that we'll tell you about a little bit later in much more detail. So now um, I want to just present some highlights of the executive summary of the report itself. Um, I'm not going to read all the words on the page uh, for self-evident reasons, but rather highlight uh, some important points to emphasize. Um, overall, and this, these statistics really are quite important, um, Police and security forces began by murdering 355 people uh, at the order of Daniel Ortega and injuring more than 2,000 in April of 2018. And from then through present, more than 1,600 political prisoners have been arbitrarily detained in the country. Um, all of this ultimately led to Daniel Ortega realizing that what little popular legitimacy had had evaporated. And when the opposition presidential candidates uh, came together and agreed not to compete with each other to run against Ortega, but to compete in a single primary to choose one candidate to go up against Ortega, he knew he was going to lose. He forced three to flee into exile of the candidates, and seven of them were imprisoned or put under house arrest. And this began the most recent wave of oppression that we've experienced. Um, the conditions were terrible. We'll talk more about that as well. Um, and it was not just simply uh, people following the orders uh, of uh, Ortego and Murillo, but rather uh, also trying to set up a new set of repressive laws and amendments to existing laws to try to legalize what was flagrantly in violation of international law and did not come close to meeting any uh, international standards and often violated Nicaraguan law itself. Uh, the international community took many different actions against the Ortega regime, and we'll speak more about that in a few moments. Um, for our purposes, of course, we, uh, it was just mentioned that 222 of the political prisoners were deported uh, uh, from Nicaragua, and with the uh, help of the United States, State Department, and USAID, um, were brought from Managua to Washington on a direct flight. Um, the reality is that uh, this has kind of only, only been, begin, been the beginning of the next stage of these people's lives, and Felix and uh, Juan Sebastian will speak to that. Um, quite quickly, right after uh, the flight landed, uh, all of them were denaturalized by the regime. Um, and while the rescue of these 222 people is very, very important, uh, at the same time, there is much left to be done to continue to assist them. And it's worth emphasizing that most had to leave uh, their family behind, and there are more than 150 minor children of these 222 that remain in Nicaragua, separated from their fathers and mothers. Um, subsequently as well, 94 other people were denaturalized, including our panelist, Rosalia Miller. And our report focuses on Daniel Ortega and Rosario Murillo as the creators of this comprehensive system of repression, which again, we'll talk about more further. And uh, we have six specific recommendations, uh, which we'll also talk about later, um, to uh, to then um, talk about what we think needs to be done uh, to address the ongoing situation of the at least 36 and probably more political prisoners that remain in the country. So now I'm going to turn it over to my uh, colleague uh, Juan uh, Wills, and he will talk through a number of different uh, sections of this report, and then I'll come in at the end and pro uh, provide a summary of the detailed recommendations. El Chipote could not break us. They used every technique to dehumanize us, and it was very hard. These were the words of one of the former political prisoners that we interviewed in the making of this report. While we were drafting this report on February 9, 2023, I received a call from Victoria Cárdenas, the wife of Juan Sebastián Chamorro, who is here today, telling me the prisoners were being released. 
We decided that this was a major breakpoint for our report and we, dis we had to interview prisoners, former prisoners, in order to have first-hand information of what we were documenting. As such, we, document, we, uh, we had 14 interviews with former pol political prisoners and with family members of current political prisoners. All of this in order to have profiles of prisoners within the report in order to shed light into the patterns of abuse that the Ortega regime is committing in this situation. So we have 20 cases of profiles of political prisoners, 25, 20 of them are from former political prisoners, some of them in El Chipote and in La Modelo and La Esperanza, and we have others, five others, which are uh, current political prisoners who are still behind bars or detained in Nicaragua under very difficult conditions. From these interviews, what we were able to find were that there were certain specific common abuses that I would like to uh, address in this moment. First of all, incommunicado detention. The form of torture that most of the prisoners actually during the interviews and what we have been researching said was the most horrible for them was the, the lack of communication with their families. They would spend at least three months at a time without communication with their families. Also, the visits, the family visits were irregular. They did not follow the protocols and the established uh, timelines that there were established both in Nicaraguan law and also in international law. And that is a very important aspect of our report. We both analyze the n local laws, Nicaraguan uh, domestic law and in domestic prison laws and international law. So definitely incommunicado detention was one of the most common abuses that we have seen uh, as a pattern of abuse by the regime. Also, the lack of food. While some of the prisoners did not complain about the quality of the food, they did complain about the quantity of the food. And what we found out during the process of the interviews and during this, uh, during this time that we were researching this, um, this report was that the regime was actually reacting uh, to international pressure within, uh, within their access to food within the prison. So for example, prisoners reported that during the summer of 2022, they started receiving more food and they had different periods of abundance of food and then a scarcity of food. And this was a clear reaction to the international pressure that the regime was facing. Also, there was a solitary confinement of women. The regime selectively confined women into solitary, uh, put women into solitary cells. Tamara Davila, Suyen Barahona, Violeta Granera, Dora Maria Telles, Ana Margarita Vigil, courageous women spent most or all of their detention in complete solitary detention. Other examples of common abuses were no access to reading materials, uh, no, access to, uh, no access to potable water, which their families had to bring every single day. The next part of our presentation, we would like to, I would like to briefly uh, mention about the perpetrators, as Jared was, uh, was, was saying before. Um, we will focus here in this report in, of course, Daniel Ortega and Rosario Murillo, um, uh, the president of Nicaragua and the vice president um, of Nicaragua and his wife, of course. Uh, given that under the principle of command responsibility, they are the ones who are responsible for all the crimes that have been committed. However, and we, if we take a look into what the group of human rights experts of the United Nations has also established, this is part, uh, this has been able to be done given that there is a whole state machine that has been able to operate along with judges, uh, police officers, detention centers, and other members of the state. In particular, some uh, state institutions that have been mentioned, especially in the UN and the United Nations most recent report on, on Nicaragua are the, um, are the public ministry, the judiciary, the national penitentiary system, the national assembly, and the ministry of the interior, all under the, res all under the command of both Ortega and, uh, and Murillo. And of course, the national assembly, which takes me to the next point, which has issued a set of repressive laws that has been able to sustain this repressive machine against political prisoner with the only intention to silence the opposition. So as I was saying, the National Assembly issued a set of repressive laws. In our report, we conducted an analysis, an analysis of, uh, of these local laws that have been used and misused by the regime in order to prosecute, charge, convict, um, and silence the opposition. The most, uh, the most common law used in order to prosecute political prisoners was the Sovereignty Law 1055. 
a specific detail about this law is that it is not a criminal legislation. It is actually an administrative law uh, uh, provi uh, pr providing that uh, individuals who are labeled as terrorists or as uh, traitors to the homeland, that's the language that the, that the law is using, uh, should be barred from holding public office. Therefore, the regime has, been, ha has, been, has had to resort to the criminal code, specifically Articles 410 and Articles 412 of the criminal code. So this has been the most common law for which uh, political prisoners are being charged for being traitors to the homeland, not even a criminal legislation. There's also the special cyber crimes law, which has been used in order to prosecute political prisoners as uh, prop uh, for propagation of false news. This is the case, for example, of Bishop Rolando Alvarez. Um, and this is also one of the laws that has been used. Other laws that we have analyzed, and this, during the process of this report, we also had consultations with local Nicaraguan lawyers in order to provide a deep and an accurate analysis within our report, are the reform to the criminal procedure code. And this one was a very important aspect, given that the regime modified an article to the criminal procedure code in order to, held to hold political prisoners for up to 90 days in pretrial detention uh, in a so-called constitutional guarantees hearing. Uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a constitutional guarantees hearing. Other laws were, other reforms were the constitutional reform uh, for the loss of the nationality of individuals, uh, political prisoners, and the, a hate crimes constitutional reform. I am aware of my, of, of my time, so uh, we are trying to go very, uh, very quickly so that we can go back to Jared and hear the, the recommendations. Finally, I would like to talk about um, the international legal aspect of all this. So we have a clear violation of international law and what has occurred with political prisoners in Nicaragua. Not only international law, but also con uh, uh, local constitutional Nicaraguan law, which provides for certain rights, which are also in enshrined in human rights treaties to which Nicaragua is a party, such as um, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the, American uh, and the American Convention of Human Rights. These are just some of the human rights that were violated and we analyzed deeply in our report, the freedom of opinion and expression, freedom of assembly and association, freedom of religion and belief, right to participate in public affairs, right to a fair trial. This was very important. These prisoners were subjected to severe due process violations. They did not have uh, fair trials. Uh, some of them even reported meeting their lawyers three to five minutes before their trials. This is not a right, um, th this is, all of this constitutes a severe violation of due process. And finally, also in the international analysis of our, of our report, we analyzed what has been the response of the international community to what has been going on in Nicaragua in regards to political prisoners. So we have a whole array of um, strategies from the international community, including sanctions, including legislation in specific countries, declarations, uh, condemnations, even tweets are very important in all, of this, um, in, in all of this arena. For example, the Organization of American States has been very important in, um, in, creating, different, uh, uh, in, in creating different groups that document the abuses in Nicaragua. For example, the group of, in the, uh, group of independent human experts, also the United Nations group of human rights experts, and different other organizations and con individual countries such as the United States have also proven to be very, uh, very vocal in what is going on in Nicaragua. And and additionally, um, uh, Chile, which President Boric has also been very, uh, very vocal in, in this aspect. So this is just like uh, a, a very brief uh, overview of what we are explaining in our report and how the international community has been able to respond to this situation. And of course, now I'll pass along to Jared to tell us what else can be done and what specific recommendations we should uh, take into account now moving forward. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, We'll take, we're only, we've got two slides left, so uh, we're right at the end here. Um, so I just want to conclude by looking at our specific recommendations that we have put forward um, and, um, and just run through them quickly. Uh, again, there's much, much more detail that's actually in our report itself. Um, you know, the first uh, set of uh, recommendations is more targeted uh, financial sanctions, um, uh, you know, and, uh, and uh, other uh, ways to put enormous pressure on the Ortega regime and, uh, and its cronies. Uh, I think this has proven to be one of the most effective tools at hand. Um, we have ourselves 
and to the right parties would be willing to share a much broader list of perpetrators, about 25 of them that we've researched. Um, but for the time being, um, we, we don't yet want to make those public. Um, but I think that's going to continue down that road is going to be very important. We also need to look at joint actions across multilateral institutions, and most uh, especially Kabay, which has been the lifeline for the regime financially. And in particular, we're looking at our allies, who we think very highly of, the Republic of Korea and Taiwan, but who have been voting to support more money for Nicaragua. Um, finally, on this page, uh, you can see as well that there's a lot more that can be done um, through multilateral institutions. And uh, again, there's more detail in the report itself. We also want to do, uh, have more work being done by national governments to highlight the plight of Nicaragua's political prisoners, and here are a number of examples of things that we talk about. Uh, more joint civil society efforts are going to be very important. We're delighted to have been able to have the ability to prepare this comprehensive report uh, in English. Um, we uh, still need resources to translate into Spanish, and I think that the more the organizations work collaboratively, uh, the more effective that we can all be. And then lastly, um, I would just mention media engagement. It was instrumental in our efforts uh, with Berta Valle and uh, Victoria Cardenas, the wives of Felix and Juan Sebastian, um, you know, op-eds in newspapers, um, you know, press conferences on at moments of key things happening, um, you know, traveling the world and, uh, you know, meeting with people from in many different capitals. All this needs to happen for the remaining political prisoners and for what might um, be to come next. So uh, the, the last thing, um, that I'll just note here is that um, obviously the greatest fear of any political prisoner is to be forgotten. And what we tried to do is really focus on the plight of the political prisoners to be able to highlight how this re repressive system has been put together and how it operates. Um, the reality is that this is going to be uh, continue to be a very difficult fight, not only to get the remaining political prisoners out, but obviously what I think we all want, which is a restoration of democracy through peaceful means um, in Nicaragua itself. Um, what we've also learned, and we describe in, in some detail in our report, is that pressure on Daniel Ortega has worked. Uh, the 222 would not have been released but for the work of many uh, people around the world, um, the families of the political prisoners as well. Uh, and that really is a key takeaway from our report. Are in the room, there's actually going to be copies of the, of the book. Uh, so as you walk out from the event when it's over today, you can grab yourself a copy for those of you who are watching online, uh, virtually, uh, it's my understanding that Jared's going to be putting up a virtual or a digital copy uh, of, the, uh, of the book rather, quick, rather soon. Um, I now have the, the great good fortune of introducing uh, the uh, moderator for today's panel. It's the Americas Program's new Deputy Director and, and Senior Fellow, Chris Hernandez-Roy, for his second event in as many weeks, although his first in English. Um, Chris has dedicated his extensive career to advancing democratic governance, strengthening rule of law, respect for human rights, and holding authoritarian regimes accountable for their abuses throughout the hemisphere. He has held various senior leadership positions at the Organization of American States, having served as a senior political advisor to two secretaries general. In this capacity, he most recently documented the abuses of authoritarian regimes in Venezuela and in Cuba, and co-led the organization's efforts to hold the Venezuelan regime accountable for possible crimes against humanity. It's truly a privilege to have Chris as part of our team. And as Nicaragua appears to be following the all too familiar path laid out by the dictator's playbook, I'm convinced that there's absolutely nobody better than Chris to lead today's discussion on political prisoners and the future of Nicaragua. Chris. Thank you very much, Jared, for that, sorry, Ryan, for that kind uh, introduction and thank you, Jared, for all of the work you've done, not only uh, on this particular issue uh, of political prisoners in Nicaragua, but uh, the work that you've done, frankly, throughout the region and around the world. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with you on Venezuela, um, and I hope that you and, and Juan will continue your, your good work. Um, it's my honor now to, to move to the second portion of our event, where we'll have a, a moderated discussion uh, with our, our three distinguished panelists, um, who I'd like to introduce to you. Our first panelist is Juan Sebastián Chamorro, a former Nicaraguan presidential candidate. Uh, an economist by training, Dr. Chamorro obtained his PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and is also the former executive director of the Nicaraguan Foundation for Economic, so for economic and Social Development. Um, he was jailed, as we know, by the regime for his activism and for campaigning for democracy and was released um, as one of the 222 in February. Our next panelist is Rosalia Miller, 
president of the Nicaraguan Freedom Coalition and co-founder of the Latino Student Fund. A longtime organizer and educator, Ms. Miller has been a leading voice among the Nicaraguan diaspora, calling for the restoration of democracy and respect for human rights. She's been named Washingtonian of the Year and is the recipient of a Public Service Congressional Award and was appointed to the Congressional Latino Council in 2009. Our final panelist today is Felix Maradiaga, also a former Nicaraguan presidential candidate and former prisoner, has been noted. He served as the president and founder of the Fundación para la Libertad de Nicaragua, a think tank and adv advocacy organization dedicated to promoting civil liberties and respect for democracy in Nicaragua and throughout Central America. I'm also very pleased to share that Felix was recently selected as the recipient of the 2023 Courage Award at the latest annual Geneva Summit for Human Rights and Democracy. Congratulations, Felix. Each of our panelists will present some initial remarks, and then we'll have a, moderate, a brief moderated discussion uh, to leave a bit of space uh, for a Q&A segment at the end. Juan Sebastián, let's, let's start with you. All right, so I'll go to the podium. <coughs> Sit here. Thanks, Chris, for the introduction. Ryan, thank you very much. Jared, Juan, thank you. Rosalia, Felix, always a pleasure to be with you. Thanks, all of you, for being here this afternoon. My experience as a political prisoner is not very different from the rest. It was a continuous violation of my human rights. Eight months before I was arrested, the regime violated my right to mobilize as I was unable to travel outside the capital city of Managua. I was under house arrest for some time. I was basically kidnapped without a warrant, order, and at night violating the law. I was denied to make a call to my family and I could not speak to my lawyer until not 24 hours, not 48 hours, not a month, but nine months after my arrest. And that was only for just two minutes, just before my trial and in the presence of an officer. The regime violated all the norms of due process during my trial which was basically a farce. I was not allowed to speak in jail, not even to my cellmates. I was denied reading and writing material. We were under interrogations every single day, even after I was sentenced for 13 years in prison the day of my birthday, February 23rd, last year. So when I analyze everything that happened to all of us in the last five years. I can only conclude that Ortegas is one of the most brutal and repressive regimes in the world. This is a very important report because it explains in a comprehensive way what happened in the last five years and continue to happen. I'm sure it will serve as an indispensable reference for many around the world who would like to know what is happening in Nicaragua. The report also stresses the fundamental challenges Nicaragua is still facing regarding human rights and democratic changes. Regarding to the first point, human rights, the recommendations of the report that Jared just presented are crucial. We need to put pressure on the regime to release the remaining political prisoners, including Bishop Alvarez, of course. We need to keep the Nicaraguan case present everywhere, in every forum and in every country. Pressure must be put to international organizations to condition material resources to the regime ensuring that they are used for the benefit of the Nicaraguan people and not the governing family. With respect to the second point, 
democratic change, there is a challenging struggle in front of us. The end result of this struggle is pretty obvious, the end of the Ortega dictatorship. The end of Ortega dictatorship through peaceful and democratic means. We should get rid of the dictator and ensure that never again another dictator could get to power. We need to establish a new and a strong democratic nation where we can all live in peace and in justice. In order to achieve this democratic change and to become a democratic nation, we need to move into two main fronts. In the international front, we need to continue denouncing the regime's crimes until the perpetrators presented in this report, for example, are brought to justice. As opposition, we must guide, must guide the international community in implementing a coherent strategy aimed at isolating, denouncing, and condemning the dictatorship. The local front, Nicaraguan front, is always fundamental to bring changes. No democratic change has taken place without the participation of local people. Leaders in exile can only guide and help, but it's the responsibility of those suffering in the country to do whatever is necessary to bring changes. So first we need to concentrate in union, thinking about this internal front. Put all of our efforts to conduct a local strategy intended to challenge the dictator. Obviously, the repression conditions are hard, so we must be very creative in challenging the regime into, in a safe but significant way. We need the support of everyone in the country, regardless of their origin or their thinking. Everyone who is willing to fight through peaceful and nonviolent means. We have identified a series of weaknesses of the regime that can be exploited in order to provoke internal problems and internal conflicts. We have to provoke and make the regime to commit more mistakes and isolate them even more from the Nicaraguan people and from the rest of the world. I think we have done a lot in putting Ortega in this internationally isolated and locally rejected position. I believe it's a matter of time. If we do things correctly, the dictator will go. It is also our responsibility as Nicaraguans to design and successfully implement a strategy for the future of Nicaragua after Ortega, to correct the mistakes of the past and live in a free country once and for all. Thank you. Thank you. Rosalia, will you share some thoughts with us? Yes, with pleasure. Um, good afternoon, and um, thank you, Ryan Burr and uh, Chris Hernandez Roy, for the opportunity to speak today uh, in the midst of two accomplished Nicaraguan leaders, Felix and Sebastián. I will try to be as brief as I am directed to do, but I might just go over a few seconds. Um, political prisoners are individuals who have been sanctioned by legal systems and imprisoned by political regimes, not for their violations of codified laws, but for their thoughts and ideas that have fundamentally challenged existing power relations. In Nicaragua, the legal system is corrupt. It incarcerates persons without due process whose thoughts and ideas fundamentally challenge the Ortega regime. It punishes basic actions such as carrying the national flag in public places or posting a comment on Facebook, mentioning the idea of holding public office, for example, being a relative of a member of the opposition, and with the hard, harshest punishments directed to those praying in public. 
condemnations of the situation of political prisoners in Nicaragua by practically all international organizations are well known. From reports and resolutions of the Organization of American States to the United Nations, from Amnesty International to America's Watch, etc. Hence, there is no lack of evidence of crimes against humanity committed by Ortega. The status quo reminds us of the days, those days a long time ago, where a symbol of swastikas uh, symbolized repression. On February 9th, three months and two days ago today, Ortega deported 222 Nicaraguans and deprived them of their nationality. Shortly after, he added to that list 94 members of the opposition, including myself, illegally depriving us of our nationality and systematically confiscating properties, their properties. The Ortega regime continues with its repression just last week. Between 40 and 50 opposition members were rounded up in the middle of the night in prison without due process. Some were eventually released, but with the conditions that they need to report daily to the authorities. And it goes on and on. The most well-known political prisoner is our bishop, Rolando Alvarez, most likely the only Catholic bishop who is behind bars, bars in the Western world. Monsignor Rolando Alvarez is being treated inhumanely and tortured. This is intolerable, not accepted. Because of the secrecy of the Ortega regime, we can only estimate the number of political prisoners today. It's estimated that there are more than 37 political prisoners in Nicaragua, but the number can quickly change. What can the United States, the region, and the international community do to promote a peaceful return to democracy in Nicaragua? Decisive actions need to be taken by the international community regarding the situation in Nicaragua. The hope for negotiations with, Orte with the Ortega regime is nothing more than an illusion. Just, uh, excuse me, Ortega only responds to decisive pressure. Coherent and strong actions are needed from the international community. The United States approved the Renacer Act on November 10, 2021, the Bipartisan Public Law Number 11754. The bill establishes measures to monitor, report on, and address corruption and human rights abuses in Nicaragua. Specifically, Renacer directs us, uh, U.S. leadership. Uh, international, at international financial institutions to advocate for increased oversight with respect to any loan or financial or technical assistance for projects in Nicaragua. There is no need to waste time thinking about what can the United States do. The Renaissance Act provides the necessary guidance. Compliance with public law 11754 would be sufficient. The first step, the law directs the Department of State and the Department of the Treasury to establish coordinated strategy to sign, align diplomatic engagement with the implementation of tar targeted sanctions to facilitate free, fair, and transparent elections in Nicaragua. Pursuant to this strategy, President Biden must prioritize implemented targeting sanctions on persons obstructing the establishment of conditions necessary for such elections. The State Department must continue to engage in diplomatic efforts with partner countries to impose targeted sanctions on such individuals. But today, today, Renaissance is dormant. It needs a transfusion to restitute the muscle power it was intended to have, to lift it to the level of what it is supposed to do. Specifically, the bill requires the State Department to report on the involvement of Ortega, members of his family, and senior government officials in significant acts of public corruption. Russian activities in Nicaragua including cooperation between Russian and Nicaragua military personnel and intelligence services. Iranian activity should also be added. All purchases and agreements entered into by Nicaragua with respect to its military or intelligence sector and gross human rights violations by the Ortega government. 
I want to further underline actions that can be taken within the framework of the Renaissance Act, such as the regime's assets in the United States should be identified. They should not only include members of the Ortega Murillo family, but also other high members of the government of the armed forces. Their assets should be frozen. The United States should encourage similar actions by its allies around the world, particularly in Europe, Canada, and Latin America. Targeted sanctions should be directed at firms, enterprises, including their owners and managers, linked to the regime that are benefiting from exports to the United States. Targeted sanctions should continue for the Nicaraguan army and its financial investments should be investigated. A public report should be prepared on funding received by the regime from the international financial institutions, indicating which countries vote for this funding and the status of the funds that have been approved. And you know what? Questions should be asked. Has the regime, the, has the regime com complied with the loan agreements? Are there audits? Are regime-related firms and enterprises benefiting from these loans? A similar report should be produced in the Central American Bank for Economic Integration dealings with Nicaragua, including the role of members, its members, who are Argentina, Colombia, Costa Rica, Mexico, Panama, Spain, South Korea, and Taiwan. A report should be prepared on the role of the United Nations agencies that manage the funds from the IFIS that we call for the Ortega regime. In conclusion, I strongly recommend that the Renasac Act be fully implemented. I also suggest that a joint hearing by the Senate and House representatives on the status of the implementation of public law number 11754, the Renasac Act, take place now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosalia. We will certainly take note of, of your recommendations, particularly the last ones with respect to the, uh, the Acts of Congress. Thank um, Felix? Yes. Thank you very much. I'm mindful of the time, so I promise I will stick exactly to five minutes. <laughs> First of all, Jared, thank you. It's been a, a wonderful journey to meet you, so sort of in 10 years. I always say this story in our uh, gatherings, but now I have the honor to share this um, story. I met Jared in Argentina about 10 years ago through the World Economic Forum, and at the time I was uh, traveling Latin America trying to let the world know about what was happening in Nicaragua. Very few people listened at the time. And I was frustrated after a meeting with some heads of states talking about free trade, and uh, I decided not to join uh, a party, and, and this uh, wonderful human being uh, introduced himself and says, you know, what do you do? And I said, I don't think you're going to care about the work I'm doing. And, and I started to, say, to tell about Nicaragua, and he said, I do care. I'm a human rights lawyer. And that was the beginning of a, of a journey, uh, of a journey about the suffering of the people of Nicaragua and of a great strategic mind about a problem that is not only a problem of my country, it's a global problem. I know from painful personal experience how these regimes can inflict so much suffering. My grandfather, Adam Maradiaga Cerro, in 1927 spent several months in prison and torture during the liberal conservative war. My grandfather, Adam Maradiaga Arostegui, was arrested in 1956 for being a member of the independent liberal party. My father, Adam Maradiaga, was arrested in September 1973 after being deported by Pinochet when he was a student under a scholarship. And there was a coup d'etat in Santiago de Chile. Spending five months in inhumane conditions in Managua, Nicaragua, in the old Chipote. No one prepared me to be the fourth generation of a political prisoner. It's something that I'm not at all proud. However, when I went back to Nicaragua, after being uh, on a company minor, a refugee, and someone who spent time with foster parents, I went back to Nicaragua precisely because I did not want my daughter Alejandra to suffer what my father suffered and what I suffered as being the child of a former political prisoner. However, I went back and accepted a position 
in Nicaragua as the national director of the Office of Attention of Former Combatants. And my mission at the time was to work with people who had lost their limbs because of landmines. And the tragedy of landmines at the time is that these inhumane weapons create suffering much um, longer beyond the war. Why do I speak about landmines? We know that we have the Ottawa Treaty and many people work relentlessly to uh, uh, declare these uh, weapons inhumane. They are designed not to kill the soldier, but to impact the entire team and to immobilize the team. Political imprisonment, arbitrary arrest is the equivalent. In the sense that when a person is in prison, it's not only that person who suffers, it's the entire family. Political movements are immobilized. Suddenly we do not talk about things that, that Juan Sebastian and I care so much about education, private property, freedoms, human rights, human dignity. Everyone has to mobilize around the issue of freeing the prisoners. That's what we're doing now to get Monsignor Rolando Alvarez, the bishop of my own diocese. We know that that's the mission. We know that that's the task. But there's an entire nation who is in prison. Even if we release 40 prisoners, even if we release Jesus Castro who has been in a hospital, completely incommunicado since September 2021, even if we release every of those political prisoners, there's a country that lives in an entire prison that is called Nicaragua. And this is happening in China, it's happening in Russia, and as discussed recently with Eugenia Clara Mursa, we recently went to Canada to advocate for the release of Vladimir. This is a global tragedy, it is a calamity, it is an epidemic that we need to solve through an international treaty. So I would like to ask, that if we mix the power of love, as we saw with Berta Valle and with Vicky Cárdenas, how a heart and the power of love and families around the world can do with a brilliant mind, such as Jared and your team, thank you, Juan Felipe, as well. So when we team together, we can free the world. We can flee Vladimir Karamursa, and we can flee every single political person. But if we take this as seriously as in my previous generation, people took care of landmines through the Ottawa Convention. So I'd like to ask this wonderful center, the Center for Strategic Studies and uh, 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 um, International Studies, to please help us launch an international campaign to have a new treaty on political imprisonment and arbitrary detention. May God bless you. Thank you very much. Sorry, we're over for seconds. <laughs> thank, thank you, Felix. Um, I, I think that was not only keeping to the clock, but really rather inspirational. I, I've never heard of the effects of political prisoners being compared to the effects, the insidious effects of, of landmines, which, as you say, are designed to disable, to de, uh, and to destroy not only one life, but but but. Uh, the teams and, and the people around them. So that's that's certainly something that we we, we will all probably take away from from today's meeting. Um, I want to just keep the focus for one question. I think that I'll just direct generally at, all, at the three of you. Um, keep the focus on political prisoners, and then I'll want to move out a little bit and, and look to the future and talk about um, you know what 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 is the future of Nicaragua and and what can be done to sort of uh, to hopefully steer it back um, on a democratic path. Um, all three of you have been victims in different ways, prisoners, uh, your nationality has been snatched away, stolen from you. Um, what does justice look like for you? Especially, uh, I mean, there's, there's you know, no hope for justice in, in Nicaragua today. Maybe you can look to international justice. Maybe you have to wait to the day that Nicaragua returns to democracy and, and, and seek justice at that time. But on a personal level, what, what, does, what does justice look for each one of you? If you could just comment very quickly on that. Well, Chris, I, I grew up uh, believing that uh, the rule of law was the rule of the land and that we were all equal under the law. And to feel in person the violation of all these rights, I mean, it's kind of hard to find a, a, a right that has not been violated in our case. Uh, uh, completely changed the, my opinion, not about the law, but how states and dictators can manipulate the law in order to achieve their goals. It was, as I said, a farce. I mean, our trial was uh, behind doors. There were no witnesses. The, the witnesses were all police officers. And we faced um, 
all these fires uh, in a very serious manner. I mean, it was very hard. At the end, what they wanted to do is to take away of all the hope that we had and to destroy our families. Because, you know, when you, even, even if you don't believe in the legal system, you're still condemned to 13 years in prison. And that's 20, 20, 2033, right, was the date of our... So my family, which is something that I really want to bring into this discussion, are victims as well, and probably more affected victims than ourselves because of the um, manipulation of, of the law. Just to give you an example, and the report says more than 150 minors le were left behind with that, when that plane uh, left. Nicaragua to DC. Uh, so again, you see the manipulation of law, of the law, in order to infringe as much pain as possible. And this goes beyond the, the prisoner. It goes all the way to the family and to the country. And international law, I think, it takes time, but it's a resource that uh, we we must seek. Um, yes, you know it's um. It's a very good question and something that really search, makes me search my heart and soul. I studied, I'm an Asuncionista. I, I went to Catholic convent school in Nicaragua. And my own family and the school instilled in me that sense of justice and social justice specifically. Um, when I came to the United States in 1957 to study, a long time ago, of course, um, from that day until now, and living in the United States on and off, um, that sense of justice has been with me, and I think it will be until my last days on Earth. What, um, so to answer your question more specifically, I believe that the sense of justice is going to come to Nicaragua, but when the time is right. That doesn't mean that we need to be dormant about it, but I think it will come because it should bring sense of justice to the people who are in Nicaragua now suffering hunger, persecution, intimidation, and that anxiety of those 150 children and all the Nicaraguan children, all the youth. We don't even know what that's gonna look like for them when they get to be teenagers, adults. So I think that I have faith that justice will come about specifically to those young children who deserve better. That's what justice in Nicaragua looks like someday. But we mustn't stop looking for that and working for it. Yeah, thank you. Three things very specifically. First, removing Ortega. As long as Ortega is in power, political prisoners will continue to be there and they, we will have no justice. Let me give you two examples, one that is global and one that is local. Putin was part of the KGB. And he tortured people, and that's documented. But precisely because there was no justice at the time, he came into power as a head of a state, and he's causing the global problem that we know. Ortega tortured people. He was the head of a state when the Mosquito community was assassinated. Five million people were killed during the so-called Navidad Roja, the Red Christmas. And many of his allies, members of his cabinet, returned to power as members of Congress, members of civil society, Nicaraguans never discussed that. So it's very important that we take justice as something that is comprehensive. Number two, making sure that victims are heard and there's a process of truth, giving them a voice. And number three, making the legal actions of reparation and making sure that this will never happen again. So justice is not theoretical. Justice is not something that could, uh, it's not part of a political plan. If we, and I'm so glad that I'm sharing this panel with someone that shares these ideas, we have discussed this thoroughly with Juan Sebastián, we cannot pursue a political process that doesn't have justice as a comprehensive part of our plan. Thank you. St sticking on this theme for a minute, um, all three of you have talked um, about the need for the international community, for civil society, uh, for international organizations to more effectively put a spotlight on what's going on, not only with the abuses, but uh, you know, the, the authoritarian tendencies and, and actions of the government to consolidate its control. Uh, how exactly, um, like, it's easy to call for more attention. Beyond the work, uh, for instance, that, that Jared and, and, and Juan have been doing, 
Can you give some concrete examples, some very specific things uh, that can be done uh, to bring more of this to light and, and as, a, as a result, galvanize further attention by the international community? Definitely, I can, if I may. <laughs> well, I go back to the Renaissance Act. I think that is really the next step that needs to be taken. I cannot emphasize that enough. We have the tools, it's written into law. It has to be implemented. I don't need to, unless you want me to go over exactly what the Renaissance Act, um, the task that it has to implement, um, the pressure that's needed. We need sanctions, but not just sanctions. We need to be very careful how those are applied and to whom they should be applied. But definitely, you know, we do have the tools. Another good thing that we have is the collaboration of, say, the European Union. You know, there are other countries who are willing and interested um, in put, helping us put that pressure. Um, I, I'll leave it at that, I think the others. Okay. Uh, I'll actually turn to both Juan Sebastián and, and Félix for, for a different question, and, and we'll return to sanctions uh, in a minute. Um, the opposition needs to have a plan. The opposition is now completely in exile. Um, how are you planning to organize the opposition so that it has a more effective voice, a unified voice, in order to confront the regime? Well, I was uh, alluding to the, uh, this overall strategy uh, that the opposition, which I believe the majority is still in Nicaragua, the immense Nicaraguan people are is against Ortega. Uh, the leaderships uh, might, be, might be in exile, but the vast majority of uh, opposition is in Nicaragua under very hard conditions. So I, I wanted to stress in my initial remarks the importance of having a strategy. And this strategy has to be in two, in two platforms. One is the international community, which is one of the questions that you raised earlier. And we have to understand, uh, this is extremely important, especially for many Nicaraguans, that the solution is not, is not gonna come from abroad. There's no savior that is gonna liberate us. It's the people of Nicaragua with the assistance of the international tools that mm -hmm. are available in which sanctions, the international community, the international courts are, are available. So, uh, so first of all, to raise this idea that a savior from abroad is gonna save us. Uh, they're gonna help the cause for justice, for democracy, but it's within the country that uh, we need to put and continue to put pressure on the dictator. The dictator has shown signs, and uh, believe us, uh, we, we were in, the, in this cell and we saw the system from within. Uh, they're not strong. They're using the weapons, the AK-47s, the army, the police officers, and I would say some of them. Uh, not the majority of the armed forces are with him. Uh, this is obvious. Uh, so we need to put together a strategy, a local strategy, in combination with a, with a sound, um, <clears throat> international strategy, a sound um, local strategy to put pressure and challenge the, the dictator because that's the way dictators fall. They don't, they don't fall apart because just time goes on. They fall apart because people, local people, put pressure and break this, uh, this uh, system. We can go into some uh, uh, details of uh, nonviolent methods, but I, but I think the fundamental issue here is that uh, we should take advantage of those weaknesses that are present within the regime to uh, actually um, uh, break them apart. And that's the role that you know, this exile leadership uh, can have in the sense that utilizing all this experience, all this uh, knowledge that we have accum accumulated, accumulated in the last five years to, uh, to actually uh, help and assist uh, what, not, what needs to be done inside the country. I want to return to the issue of uh, the regime not being strong and there being fissures in the, re in the regime in a minute, but I'd like to give uh, Felix a, a chance to... Yeah, on the question of strategy, first, globalize. First, it is very important to understand that Daniel Ortega is part of an ecosystem of dictators. So the world needs to know, as we actually said in the book on published in 2008 in this town, that Ortega is part of the axis of annoyance. I recently said in one of my talks, that's no longer annoyance, it's the axis of evil. Ortega established very close relationship with Iran, with China. There's a large espionage base in Russia. A lot of people in this town doesn't know that. So we need to globalize, number one. Number two, we need to isolate. It's important to cut all the channels of financing of, of the regime. And there's a lot to know. I wanted to publicly thank Ryan for all the work that you've done 
on that very, uh, very important second pillar. Three, we need to connect, and Juan Sebastián talked about that. So we cannot be in a position in exile talking to the people in exile. We need to connect with those in, in Nicaragua. We need to protect the grassroots. And we're making very clear that now most of the speaking role is ours. Everyone in Nicaragua who raises a flag, who writes an article, gets uh, 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 in prison. So uh, that's part of the larger strategy. There's much more, but as you know, the bad guys are listening. But those are the points. <laughs> That's a very good point. Um, Rosalia, you talked about the, the Renacer Act. Um, there, there, there are a series of sanctions that um, are imposed uh, on Nicaragua, on the regime. Um, perhaps more can be done. Um, what, what, what elements of an effective sanctions regime do you think can be added to the regime that's already in place? But keeping in mind that, that you know, it would be important not to affect the general population in Nicaragua. What, what new things can be done? Or are there simply things, I think, as you've alluded to, that are already in place but are not being fully implemented? Exactly, yes. And I, I, let me reiterate that I would never advocate for anything that would um, hurt the people of Nicaragua, of course. And that's why I said that sanctions need to be targeted to individuals. Uh, and eventually even to impress us and so on. But it has to be done. It's a delicate matter, right? So what else can be done? Well, I mentioned some of them, and I, I'm going to stick to one specifically, or maybe two. Um, I think that um, the State Department with the Treasury Department really need to take a look and, and see, investigate the accounts that the circle of corruption around Ortega those accounts that are in the United States and they should be frozen. We also have people in the army, in the ejército, who have those, those accounts. I mean, they're benefiting from, from, the, from the economy here in this country, um, from, from uh, Wall Street, for instance. So that's, that's one of the two points, but I, I have read, um, mentioned others that I wrote about over the weekend. Um, there are others, um, but I think that, um, you know, I always, it's so easy to give a whole list of um, ideas, but I think maybe that's the point, that we need to, as you suggested, you know, a couple of items, a couple of suggestions, uh, and I think those two are the ones that I'm going to stick with at this time. Okay. Um, returning to this idea of the regime not being strong, Juan Sebastián, um, there are fissures within the regime, not least of which, uh, you know, people who support Daniel versus uh, people uh, who support um, his wife. Um, what other fissures are there? Are there fissures in the military? And how can we exploit these fissures to, to, to as you said, to, to, uh, you know, to weaken the regime even further? To identify them and separate them. Just to give you an example, one of the uh, usual sanctions that uh, the US implements, a targeted sanction, is to uh, strip the, the visas. Mm -hmm. uh, those guys are, are not even thinking about traveling to the U.S., of course. So the sanction in itself might not be that efficient. And, the, and it's worse because uh, you cannot make public those names, right? Uh, but if you can find, and I believe I'm not a lawyer, maybe the lawyers can help us in this regard, uh, if there's a way that we can get the names of those perpetrators who got the visa stripped away, then we're doing something in different because you are implementing social sanctioning. You're sanctioning individuals with the last names and their families. So by identifying those perpetrators and, and, and showing them in, in society, in Nicaragua society, you start to divide, and that's why I, in my remarks I mentioned, try to generate these internal conflicts mm -hmm. that you identify those perpetrators and people will walk away from them, including their subordinates in the, in the police and the armed forces, which I know for sure are people who are Azul y Blanco. Which brings me to, uh, to a, a fundamental problem, getting into too much detail here and the bad guys are listening, but that's okay because uh, uh, I think this, this, uh, we need to identify the, uh, uh, those guys who are responsible instead of doing some more general kind of uh, punishment that will put in the same bag people that might help us in the future. So this, this, this is particularly important because we haven't, we haven't um, <clears throat> sanctioned not a single paramilitary 
And we do have evidence with last names, location, evidence by GA and the, the OEA and so on of perpetrators that actually kill people. We have people that, are wi that witness all these things, and we have the tools to identify those perpetrators. So we need to move on that, on that front, just to give you uh, an example. And you know, there's all these all discussions about uh, sanctions. Uh, they do care about it. I don't know how many questions you received during the interrogation, but it was all about sanctions. So that means uh, that sanctions uh, worried them. Or Daniel Ortega himself said that he was not worried about sanctions, which in a way means that he's worried about sanctions. So, uh, so, um, so they, they do work when they are, uh, but what we need to find more uh, a smart way of identifying those uh, uh, perpetrators and try to isolate the bad guys from the good guys because at the end, we're gonna need everybody inside the country to help us uh, expand those cracks within the, the Ortega's uh, regime. I'm going, to, I'm going to ask uh, one last question to Felix and then uh, open it up uh, for some questions from the public. Uh, taking the spotlight further out, looking at the region, this is not so much a question about Nicaragua, but Nicaragua is clearly uh, affected by this. The region now has three full-blown dictatorships, right? Yeah. Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua. It has at least two semi-authoritarian regimes, which I will not mention right now. And it has one completely failed state, Haiti. What does this mean for, for the health of democracy in the region? Bad news. And uh, I don't know if I can mention the Freedom House report, which, by the way, is very important. But it ends the era of optimism. Uh, for the very first time in, in a few years, the number of democracies outnumber the, those authoritarian regimes around the world. That question is why. I think that after the Second World War, um, the world prepared for this wave of democracies and the uh, infrastructure in terms of legal systems, treaties, was prepared to deal with democracies. And let me say this very clear. This system is not prepared to deal with dictatorships. Dictatorships are no longer uh, um, uh, obvious in terms of dressing like the military uh, and coming with tanks. They know how to present themselves with the facade of a democratic regime and they actually laugh of the diplomatic systems. So, so I think that the fact that we have Nicaragua using it as a case study, but I could say the same about Bashir al-Assad, for example, and many other regimes around the world, it was very clear where they were going. But the international system were treating them as not democracies, uh, uh, hybrid regimes, so they call them in some of the reports, uh, which I think that's foolish. Uh, a very clear example is it's, uh, the UN Human Rights, Rights Council. They have Cuba as a member, for example. That's outrageous. And I can give you many other examples, but I know that we're running out of time. So I think that the reason that we have these kind of regimes is something that I've been calling for years uh, in an article published in 2009, La Enfermedad de la Dictadura. It's free online. And basically what I said using the example is that when your body does not acknowledge that you are sick, you don't pursue treatment. So dictatorships work as a virus. They infect the political system. They try to pretend that they are not. And certainly when you want to fight back, it's too late. They took control of all your capacity to fight back. So it's either they or us. There's no possibility to cohabitate with tyrannies. There's no possibility to go into dialogue, international treaties with these regimes. And I think that that's the reason why we have this case in Latin America. Chris, can I make a point? Please, Rosario. Yes. Yes, um, before we go to questions, uh, I, I want to make one last point uh, in this, um, about, the, um, about Ortega and the financial institutions. It has to stop. That is what's feeding Ortega. The money that's flowing into Nicaragua with the pretext, for example, in the pandemic, let's say. It's not going to the people. And it, it's really uh, immoral the way that the financial institutions are feeding this, this, uh, this virus, this ban. Thank you. Well, let, let's hope that the international community, uh, and particularly the, the members, uh, the member states of Cabe, have heard this message loud and clear. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that there is a vote tomorrow That's right. uh, to determine uh, who will be the next uh, executive director. Um, and we'll see um, if they're listening. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Henry, who um, has received, I hope, some questions um, following the QR code. If you still would like to ask a question, please scan the QR code and it will allow you to uh, 
ask your question in the system. Henry, please, what are, your, what are the questions that you've received? Thank you, Chris. Our first, quest, our first question comes from Winali with Georgetown University, who asks, how can the Nicaraguan diaspora support initiatives towards freedom in Nicaragua, specifically those related to ad, adv advocating for political prisoners? Well, I think that kind of addresses <laughs> my part here. Um, you know, you might be surprised, you will be surprised to hear how, how intense and trying to be well organized the diaspora is um, outside of, um, in the United States and Costa Rica and in other places. Um, we are doing all kinds of um, actions, even uh, street incidents that we call. But most of all, you know, what is, I'm so glad someone asked that question, Denali, I think is her name. Uh, what, we, what the diaspora needs now and the people in exile is a validation of, what, of the work that they're doing to help Nicaragua. And that brings me to a point that before leaving here I was going to make, and that has to do with the TPS. Uh, and in fact, I have something ready, and I'm going to read it to you because we often talk about TPS, this is something for lines, but we don't really know what it does and, what, and who is involved. So let me, uh, allow me to read this. So people with temporary protected status, TPS, have lived and worked and paid taxes and contributed in the United States for many years. Many for over two decades are ra raising U.S. citizen children. CPS is an immigration program that protects people who are living in the United States from being forced to return to countries with unsafe and life-threatening conditions. The Biden administration has the power to save lives and keep families together by renewing TPS. And why am I saying that? Can you just imagine what it's like to live even thinking that overnight you might be asked to leave the country? So it's very difficult and uh, incredibly intimidating also for the diaspora, for members of the diaspora to be able to function effectively. But we are working effectively in many other areas. And that is by uniting, by coming together, by, believe it or not, tolerating each other's differences. Um, and so we hope to, to, not to make this answer so long, we hope to continue on that path to be able to, to think things through and to make a plan for the path to reach success. And what is the unsuccess is to put the pressure on Ortega and for them to actually leave that dictatorship, and they are listening. We know they are. Thank you. Do you have another question, Henry? Yes. Our next question uh, is anonymous, but it asks that often political prisoner releases tend to only pave the way for further authoritarian measures. How can the international community uh, ensure that there are consequences should conditions uh, under the Ortega Murillo regime continue to worsen? Well, I think, first of all, the, the release, our release was the result of pressure from mm -hmm. the international community. Pressure from the families, political pressure within the country, and legal pressure for organizations like Perseus, for example. Um, so our wives, and we have to recognize the, uh, the tremendous job that Berta and Vicky did uh, during this uh, uh, painful, two, almost two years while we were in prison, were knocking all the doors uh, for, uh, for the international community to, to respond. And these are the results. We're free now, so to speak, without our nationality, uh, in exile, but, uh, but free at least. Uh, so I think, you know, the, uh, the excarcelation, the liberation of uh, prisoners shouldn't be, in the case of Nicaragua, should not be interpreted as a uh, softening of the regime. Quite the contrary. What the regime is trying to do is to put us abroad and make us our job more complicated than it was before. So um, every time the, there is all uh, political prisoners in any country in the, in the world, we should uh, always speak out. I think our, our wives were one of the few because they were here in a relatively safe place uh, were one of the few who actually sp spoke out of the, uh, of the situation. Um, but there's a lot of fear from the family members within the country. But even then, uh, I think it's always a better strategy to denounce, to uh, expose, 
the arbitrary detentions uh, in order for the international community to be aware, for the local community to be aware, and to make a political cost for the dictators in order to release. And that's what we should be doing with the remaining political prisoners, and in a larger sense, to the country as a whole. I want to turn uh, to one other issue that we haven't raised, although Rosalia sort of touched on it by raising the, the TPS. Um, you know, the, the Western Hemisphere for, for a number of years now has seen huge uh, migration flows, uh, huge refugee flows, uh, to be honest. Um, but I think the, the Nicaraguan refugee situation tends to be overshadowed perhaps by the much larger flow, unfortunately, of, of Venezuelan refugees. Um, with over 200,000 Nicaraguans who have left, um, I think a large number of them are in Costa Rica and in other countries. Um, what's being done specifically to support refugees, Nicaraguan refugees, who haven't made it to the United States, who might be in Costa Rica and other neighboring countries? Can you speak, and one of you speak to that issue? Yes, uh, a number of things, not enough. We need to acknowledge that that's a humanitarian crisis caused by a political crisis, which is a dictatorship. So the only long-term solution to stop such massive migration is to get rid of Ortega. That's the only long-term solution. But uh, talking about our, our fellow Nicaraguans who are uh, going through this tremendous suffering, I'd like to just mention some of the things that I, I, I believe need to be highlighted. One is the incredible solidarity of Costa Rica. Uh, uh, the previous government and the current government made it a state policy to have an open door uh, policy of Nicaraguans. I cannot imagine what would have happened if Costa Rica would have not taken such action. So that's one thing. Number two, the High Commissioner for Refugee has been working particularly in Costa Rica uh, uh, we don't have the same level of response in other uh, countries, and they work with some uh, foreign governments to, to uh, fundraise uh, to uh, provide uh, uh, um, some medical care for uh, Nicaraguans in, in Costa Rica. In that particular case, I, I think it's important to highlight the work of USAID and the American government, who has taken leadership together with the European Union in that particular uh, part. Uh, number three, I think that uh, actions taken such as the uh, government of Spain are providing nationality to those Nicaraguans who have been stripped of their nationality. Rosalia is one of them. My wife is one of them. In, in, in my case, I've decided not to accept uh, nationality from another country. But just taking that action is not only a matter of solidarity, it sends a very powerful message to Ortega and to the world that it's important to protect these refugees. Uh, finally, the humanitarian parole granted by uh, this administration, I think is very, very important. It's also a, a clear signal of the bipartisan support to the Nicaraguan uh, community. However, uh, there is a much larger uh, wave of, of, of refugees that are not covered by the humanitarian parole, and that's an issue to be discussed. I think that it's very important to keep the advocacy bipartisan because it's very different from other political crises. So in the, in the specific case of Nicaragua, I think that we are in a good track for bipartisan support to a migration reform. I'd like to say that um, uh, together with uh, uh, um, uh, Rosalia and many other leaders of the diaspora, we have been working, all the former political candidates, we have been working together with the diaspora. And uh, the question is why? Why a former political candidates are also getting involved in this humanitarian action. Well, because the diaspora cared about us. Mm -hmm. Nicaraguans in exile, when, we're back, when we were back home, they care about us. Now it's to time, or our time to work together. So we are working as a community to find comprehensive, bipartisan migration reform for the Nicaraguan community. Yes, I'd like to add to that um, several things. And that's right, uh, Felix. Uh, we are on the same page with uh, Sebastian, with Sebastian as well. Um, first of all, of course, um, you know, Vicky Cárdenas, Victoria Cárdenas, Victoria Eugenia Cárdenas, actually, and, and Berta Maradiaga, um, we worked together when they were here in the United States. Um, it was a gift to have them, and they gave us all, especially women, young women, uh, an inspiration, an example uh, of what leadership looks like, and growth as well. Um, it's time, I think, in this conversation to acknowledge the work that the diaspora has been doing with the refugees, with the um, 222 uh, 
ex-political prisoners that arrived. Um, and you asked about, the, someone, I think, um, Vinali asked about the diaspora. And I wanted to, to, to be sure that I am so clear to share with everyone that kind of connection. We connected immediately the moment that we were able to hug each one of the ex-political prisoners that arrived at the Western Hotel on February 9th. Um, and we continue working with them, all of us. It's not one person, it's many of us. And from the start, even before the plane um, landed, we knew that USAID, for instance, had leased the plane, and State Department had done all the other planning. I mean, it's a, it's a lesson in collaboration. And that, just as Ortega copies the Cubans and the Venezuelans, the Maduros and so on, uh, so the positive side of it is that these actions have also, again, been inspiring. Uh, we continue to work with the um, 222 ex-prisoners and others as well. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a mammoth undertaking, but the spirit is there, and we do have the support. As in Costa Rica, there is support, and the United States, of course, is right there. But it just needs more things need to be done, has to be clarified better, uh, the path has to be clearer because we are getting to a place after three months and two days, um, today, that the buena voluntad, the, good, the goodwill of the people who have come to help uh, these uh, 222 ex-prisoners, political prisoners, uh, need to find other housing, need to find other opportunities, uh, the families need to be united. I mean, it's just a whole lot of things that need to take place. And I am saying that not to be an alarmist, but to be a, a realist. This is real. This is the real world. And so I think all of you who are here, all of you who are listening, um, find out what you can do. Because I think a little bit, like we say in Spanish, you know, uh, un granito de arena, a little, a little speck of sand, you know what that does. When you were a child, we used to bring, uh, build castles in the sand, uh, and they became structures. And I think we can do that. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalia. Uh, with that imagery, I think uh, that very positive imagery uh, of, of you know, uh, assisting not only the, these families, but uh, for the rest of us to, to continue to work towards uh, you know, shining uh, spotlights on the abuses and, and todos poniendo nuestro granito de arena to uh, guide the country back uh, in the right path towards democracy. Um, I, I will, on those words, uh, close the event since that we are out of time without um, before thanking uh, our esteemed international lawyers, uh, Jared and Will, and our most esteemed panelists for, for joining us today. Um, this has been very enriching for me personally, and, and you can be sure that uh, you have friends at CSIS uh, who will continue to do what they can uh, in our academic sphere. Uh, to promote democracy in Nicaragua. So. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.